Counting came about because it's a useful convenience. Keeping a tally of your income and expenses helps you be a successful merchant. For such purposes, you don't need to be philosophical about what you're doing. However, when it comes to asking about the basic nature of maths and its relationship to physical reality, details matter. When we count objects, do we know what those objects really are and where they end and begin? Visually, it may seem obvious, but our brains and senses have evolved to see the world in a particular way that helps our survival. The maths we've developed, at least in its original and most elementary form, was tailored to suit our immediate needs and way of life. Suppose creatures evolved on another world that weren't solid, but cloud-like, or that they took the form of a living sea. To such amorphous beings, counting discrete objects might not seem so obvious or natural. How much of our maths then, from the simple concept of number to the most arcane theory at the frontiers of 21st century mathematical research, is an artifact of the human condition? Those who oppose the Pythagorean notion that all is number insist that there's no guarantee our mathematical descriptions are universally applicable. As useful as maths undoubtedly is, it may be far more limited in scope and power than is generally recognised. There's also an elephant in the room whenever the topic of maths and reality comes up. The universe consists not just of inanimate objects engaged in some complicated dance that, if only we were clever enough, we'd see was choreographed by a master series of equations. It contains consciousness. Specifically, it contains us, assemblages of flesh and blood that experience what it is like to be in the world. It might be going too far to say that consciousness is an embarrassment to science, but ever since Galileo there's been a sustained effort to downplay its importance. To a large extent, it's regarded as an epiphenomenon, an almost superfluous effect due to the brain's other workings, like mist hanging over a lake. This tendency of science to overlook the one thing that's most important to us as humans, our awareness, is no accident. It was Galileo in the 17th century at the dawn of modern physics who argued that reality is divided into two types of quality, that which can be measured and that which can be experienced. Measurable qualities he referred to as being primary. These include mass, size, temperature, location, and other aspects of things that by virtue of being measurable in some way can be expressed in mathematical terms. Secondary qualities, on the other hand, exist only in the minds of sentient observers, and thus have no place of importance in the material world. Into this category of phenomena, which slip through the clutches of mathematics, are colours, sounds, and other sensations, along with all emotions and feelings such as pleasure and pain. It's true that there are measurable physical correlates to each of the components of our inner world, wavelength and radiance, for example, to our experience of colour and brightness, but science is equipped to handle only the former. Physics can deal with wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum because it can hold up an instrument to measure these wavelengths and convert them into numbers and then work on them with equations. Physicists are happy to talk about wavelengths in the range 700 to 635 nanometers and comfortable even to describe these as falling within the red part of the spectrum. But ask them to talk about the quality of redness, and they fall silent. To be fair, it isn't just a problem with physics. It's impossible by means of any symbolic or linguistic device, or any purely intellectual means to convey the sensation of redness, unless you've actually experienced it. A person who's been blind since birth, or who lacks colour vision, can never know what redness is. They may understand every aspect of the maths of light and the science of electromagnetic waves, but the sensory correlate itself 
will always be missing from their picture. It's obvious why modern science is mainly interested in measurable stuff. If it can't in the end analyse the data it collects, it has nowhere to go, and it could only analyse what's been measured. Paradoxically then, the greatest strength of science is also its greatest weakness. It excludes what it can't measure, and thereby turn into numbers, so that it can unleash the power of mathematics. But by largely excluding qualities that are dismissed as secondary, it fails to deal adequately with everything that's of greatest importance to us as living, breathing individuals. Not all physicists are comfortable with the exclusion of qualities. Particle physicist and Nobel Prize winner Richard Feynman said in one of his lectures, the next great awakening of human intellect may well produce a method of understanding the qualitative content of equations. But that's probably a pipe dream. The fact is that the qualia we experience in our minds and through our senses are not at some future stage going to emerge from our equations or our mathematics. They can't do that for a very simple reason. They've been intentionally omitted from the outset. No matter how much we improve our quantitative account of the world, it will never be able to conjure up the secondary qualities that each of us, individually, regard as being primary. Would you exchange the sensation of colour or the feeling of love for the most fantastically detailed mathematical description of how these things come about? Mathematics and physics appear so powerful because they avoid addressing those aspects of the world in which they're inherently weak or entirely powerless. Bertrand Russell, in An Outline of Philosophy, 1927, put it this way, Physics is mathematical, not because we know so much about the world, but because we know so little. It is only its mathematical properties that we can discover. And yet, having acknowledged that maths and its application to the physical universe, physics, will always appear aloof and almost irrelevant to our personal experiences, we're still left with that unreasonable effectiveness. Maths works. Physics, which is based on maths, works. They enable us to do things, amazing things through technology, that would be impossible if we relied simply on our sensations and inner feelings. We know about dark energy and Higgs bosons, different types of infinity and the maths of higher dimensional spaces, not because of the secondary qualities that make life worthwhile, but because we've learned how to separate the qualitative from the quantitative. The undeniable truth is that the world is more comprehensible to us now, through the application of maths and science, than it was to our ancestors hundreds or thousands of years ago. We've yet to fully understand the ultimate role that maths plays in the reality around us and within us. Matter dances to the tune of mathematics. Mind perceives the existence of matter and explains its behaviour through mathematics. Without actuality, which requires matter and mathematics, there'd be no mind. Somehow it seems mind, matter and mathematics rely on the presence of each other. Elements in a self-sustaining and self-actualizing cosmic triangle. 